In, the, in this video, we are focusing on synchronous uh, sequential logic. So, so far, we've been talking about asynchronous, basically, whether the inputs are synchronized with each other, with the clock, or they come in whenever they happen to change. And if you recall, when we were, when we were looking at the asynchronous situation, asynchronous um, sequential logic, what we found was, for example, for the SR flip-flop, we have two input, S and R, and uh, input wanted to change from 0, 0 to 1, 1. Let's say both inputs needed to change. But depending on which input changes first, uh, instead of going directly from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, some of these uh, changes could take you through different paths, for example, um, the, and it, call, it causes either a race or a critical race, which means your end state would be different than what you expected. And we had a case where um, this might move into 0, 1 and before moving back in here. So R would change first and then S would change, would give you one result. And then on the other hand, sometime uh, S would change before R and that would give you potentially a different uh, result. Okay. In order to avoid this, the one thing we can do is make sure that as far as the SR flip-flop is concerned, as, uh, or whatever flip-flop we are using, and it's got multiple inputs coming in here, making sure that these two inputs are somehow synchronized with each other. So we see a consistent result that we can rely on. And that's why we are kind of, most designs that are out there have walked away from asynchronous, or if you want to think about asynchronous, not clocked, okay, not clocked, not synchronized with a clock, to something called a synchronous design, or if you want to think about this one as a clocked circuit, that's fine as well. So there is a um, rhythm to the logic, and every part of the system is moving in lockstep to whatever that clock pulse is telling them to do. So how do we do that? How do we make sure that the inputs are coming at the same time, knowing that we do not have over when the inputs change, but one thing we do have is when we look at the input. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, that idea. I have here a little circuit that I pulled out, uh, which is Basically, it's, it's called the gated SR flop, uh, SR flip flop. Another name is, is the pulsed, sometimes it's also called pulsed um, uh, SR flip flop. So let's let's take a look at uh, what this looks like. Uh, typically, this is kind of the system diagram, in this case called the block diagram, but system diagram would be a better name for it. And what we've got, we've got two inputs that we are familiar with, S and R, but this is a new input we are adding. And Typically, we get the present state coming out of here. This, the next state sits in here until it's ready to come out, then becomes present state, comes out. Q sometime on some of these flip-flops that you buy off the shelf, you also get the Q naught. That's just favor to save you an inverter. That's all that is, so don't let that confuse you. So what is the C business? Let's go back here and see what they did. They took S and R and fed it to here, and then they fed a control or you can call it clock or control signal in there what does that do let's take a look at it look at what happens when c is equal to zero if c is equal to zero it really doesn't matter what s and r are this will be zero this will be zero and if you recall from the sr flip-flop um, uh, compressed table or the characteristic table we know that SR is 0, 0, it's uh, Q. So if C is equal to 0, it doesn't really matter what the value of S and R are. You're going to hold whatever output you had coming out of it. And then, so, <clears throat> so basically, you can think about C as locking things down. And then when C comes high, so let me use a different color so we can kind of distinguish them. So when C goes equal to one, then all you're gonna see here is whatever S in and is what is whatever R is. So when C is equal to zero, the only thing you're gonna see is these, but when C becomes one, then whatever S and R are affects 
your output. So that's a great way uh, to kind of um, make, a, make a difference here where you would basically see if you got a C in here, the, literally if the C, um, C is zero, it really doesn't care what S is, doesn't care what R is, Q is the answer. When C becomes a one, then it starts responding to the various S and R values. And this is called a gated flip-flop. Let me go ahead and finish this and then we'll come back around talk. So if you see, so when C is one, then S and R makes it through and the rest of this is the traditional flip-flops that we know. This would be a Q, this would be a reset, this would be a set, and this would be a zero, okay? So, so now we have a clock and let's, uh, let's take a look at this in a couple other ways. From a, from a um, state diagram, that was another thing we needed to know. So from a state diagram point of view, we can redraw this thing. Uh, now we got one more input to consider. Our states are either zero or state one. And now what we can say is that it really doesn't matter what our input is if C is equal to zero we really do not care. So, so let's let's put a legend in here so we can kind of talk about it. So what I have in here is the Q and what I have here, and now I have three inputs instead of two. I've got S, R, and C. So now my clock or control or gate or whatever you want to call it controls everything. So if I come back here, let's be, let me erase this and say I'm in state zero and I really don't care what S is. I don't care what R is, I only care what Z is. If that's the case, I'm gonna stay in state zero. The only time I'm gonna to respond to S and R and start behaving like this is when, um, when that's one. So when C is one, then if it's zero, zero, I still do this. If it's zero, one, still do that. And if it's one, one, I still do that. And then when it's one, zero one then I cross the path to the other side okay and same thing here when you come over here you say I really don't care what X is uh, S is when I don't care what R is as long as C is zero I'm going to see zero zero I'm going to stay in the same place and then now if I have um, uh, uh, get a set which is one zero one then I'll stay here all the other cases I'll go back here Zero, zero, one, zero, one, one, um, zero, one, one, one. All that takes me back there. Okay, so let me clean this up. And I shouldn't have put commas in here. Typically, we don't put commas in there. It's just a S, R, and C. Okay, one other, one other diagram that might help this situation is is if you look at pulse C, let's say pulse goes high, then goes back down, during this period, basically, Q will not change, okay? Only during this period where S and R control S and R controlled control of Q, okay? So so that's, that's a kind of a summary of that. That is great, but the problem is that if if I want to if if I make C a clock uh, and have a clock running through like this, basically I'm saying during this time if I want it to be synchronized and I want this to operate so um, each input cannot change independently, I have to force inputs to change. Input must change here and be stable here in order for me to have a synchronized system because during this time I'm looking at it and I don't want the inputs to change. There's a problem with this because it takes so long. I'm giving up half of my clock cycle for whichever I, people cannot change change their uh, um, time. So is there any way that I can shorten this? So I'll just look at it for a very short time and I let the rest of the clock cycle be used for other thing. Uh, we have a name for this, it's called the rising edge. So all I want to do, I want to change this such that all I want to do is I want the input to be only looked at right here or on the falling edge, it really doesn't matter, one of those. If this is a clock, this is your C or the clock. 
and let's say I only want things to change right here uh, of course okay if I, if, if I need to I allow a little bit of time for setup this is called the setup time and maybe a little bit after for hold so uh, but still I have the rest of the uh, clock cycle except for this 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 little bit of time I have the rest of the time to make changes to the input get ready and all that but then it sees it only on that period can you think about how you could change this circuit so instead of been looking at the output uh, looking at the input and changing the state during all of C being high so it could be what we call an edge trigger only look at the input during the rising edge this way we get our synchronization and we let the rest of the circuit do its thing during the rest of the time um, the rest of the clock cycle except for a very short time around the rising edge can you think how you could do that it now is a good time to pause the pause the video and just kind of sit there and try to think about is how could i do that when you think you figured it out you can continue running where we're going to go and look at how we're going to create an edge trigger so let's take a look so here we go if you don't want to see it now pause is a good time so so i am gonna i have a little drawing here which kind of helps us figure this out the first thing we're going to do we're going to take an input let's say whatever that input is in this case could be a clock and i'm going to run the clock directly to the end and i'm going to take the same thing and i'm going to run it through a inverter and then put it through this so let's see what is happening y is x naught but but there is a slight delay so x is here going from low to high but since it's got to go through a propagation delay y will stay high and then it goes slightly so so for example the technology we are looking at this time is about five nanosecond or thereabout okay so what happens it generates a pulse if i use this pulse as a clock to my sr flip-flop then the only time the inputs are looked at is right here that is the only time you have maybe a little bit before a little bit after you have to keep the input stable other times you could change the input anywhere and any which way you want to do that so we're going to take this and that this is this now we have moved from having be able to have all of this high enable the flip-flop to just have a little piece of this so this is here is the circuitry that we could modify basically what we can do is instead of the c coming in like this we can get rid of this well actually we shouldn't get rid of it what we could do we can add a little more circuitry to it which is basically instead of going directly here what we're going to do we're going to take and it not X comes in here and that becomes what goes in here but if you notice if X, I'm sorry this is not X this is clock might as well give it the name so clock so let's go take a look at what happens so this clock is coming in boom just changing like it's normal behavior clock the only time inputs are being seen, S and R are being seen, is right here, remember? Because this signal, this signal is going to look like, mm. okay? So typically, this is called a rising edge. If I don't like it, I can invert it and kind of have a falling edge, which means I'm only going to look at the signal during the falling edge of the clock. So this is a rising edge triggered flip-flop and typically the way they show it instead of having this in here they will have an arrow here sometimes they put a triangle here and an arrow if it's a rising edge if you want a falling edge then they, of course the arrow will go down and as, if i haven't mentioned this little piece sometimes it doesn't show up on the schematics all right so that's that brings us to the end of the how do you make a flip-flop synchronous meaning that it would accept a clock by far by far we use edge triggered and by by a great majority we use a rising edge triggered flip-flop for most of the things we do
Okay, so let's go back and do a real quick summary of all the things we've talked about so far. We started this whole conversation by saying asynchronous systems always have race problems or critical race problem, other issues because inputs are changing and we want to change two inputs and or three inputs and they change at different time. Our solution was to say, don't look at the input, only look at the input after the changes have happened. So if the two inputs have to change and they're slightly different, they can change during the off time. And then during the on time, you look at it. We started by looking at the pulse where you're looking at the inputs during the high time of the clock. We said, well, that's a bit of a, that was great, but we said that's a bit of a problem because we really would like to use all the clock cycle, as much of the clock cycle as we can to do, change our input, do activities, and then maybe just allocate a little bit of the time to be read, to be synchronized with the flip-flop. And that gave rise to this whole idea that we can use this little inverter and that gate and create a little pulse at the beginning where the rising edge is happening and use that high during that time to clock the input in or the gate to input in. And that gave rise to a rising edge flip-flop. That brings us to the end of introduction part of a um, uh, synchronized um, flip-flop. And one, one other thing I should mention when we are doing a state diagram for this, um, it's a, the, the assumption, the clock is never shown. The assumption is uh, clock, that's the only time we're looking at it. So it's assumed is there, but it's never really shown on the, um, on the state diagram. We'll, we'll have more time to talk about that in future videos.